Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Howard, uh, along with Mike Claiborne. And today, we welcome a very special guest. Uh, Brad Michael Sham has been an award-winning broadcaster. He's been with the Dallas Cowboys uh, since 1976, uh, first as a color analyst and then took over the play-by-play -play duties uh, sometime later, 42 years, I think it is, Brad. You've uh, been at the helm, 43 years, been at the helm uh, as the Cowboys play-by-play -play announcer. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Missouri Journalism School. I won't say what year, but Brad, <laughs> Go ahead and my, say it. Yeah. My, uh, my <laughs> 1951. Go ahead. And <laughs> my my good friend, my very very good friend, Brad Michael Sham. Welcome. Oh, Howard, what what I don't I don't know why it's huddle up with Howard instead of mix it up with Mike. <laughs> I'm so thrilled. I don't even know your middle name, but I'm going to find it out and use it on you every time I see you. <laughs> forever. But, uh, you know, you know what a treat it is for me to be with you. Well, Brad, let's talk a little bit about your career. Uh, as Howard mentioned, you started off as a color analyst and you were working in Dallas at a time when they kind of they had some heavyweights down there. When you think about Frank Gleber and Vern Lundquist and people of that nature, uh, those guys were legends. What was it like for you to start off in that situation working with Vern Lundquist? Um, it, it was uh literally more than I deserved, Mike. And, and um, Vern and I are still um, great, great friends, 40 something years on. Uh, I was the albatross around his neck for eight years. And, um, and then I moved over a seat when CBS moved him from college football to the NFL. Vern uh, taught me without intending to teach me. Sometimes those are the very best teachers. Um, just almost everything I know about broadcasting a football game and watching a football game. And, and I'm so glad that you mentioned Frank Gleber who um, left us so prematurely, um, gosh, close to 40 years ago at the age of 51, Frank might have been the most naturally gifted sportscaster I ever met. He could do anything and make it sound like he invented it. And uh, he was the sports director of the radio station that had the Cowboys rights at the time. And um, Frank was, again, without meaning to or trying to, he was a personal role model for me uh, about how to uh, achieve a work-life balance and uh, treat people all the same, no matter what their job was. And so to say that that was a big influence on my professional life to be with those guys for the years that, uh, that I was would be an understatement. All right. You started um, from the university of Missouri. You started off. I know you have a big love of baseball. Uh, you're a Chicago white Sox fan. I'm, I'm actually a diehard Cub fan. Cubs fan. That's too bad. Yeah, you're me. I tell people Mike all the time when when people, when people come fussing at me about the Cowboys don't win enough, and I, and I tell them, "Hey, I'm a Cub fan. I have learned all my life that I am not in this for the winning, and and it really has taught me that it's for the journey. When they won the World Series five years ago, my mother, God rest her soul, was ninety. Uh, one at the time and I said mom mom the cub and she's the reason I'm a cub fan she's the reason I'm a sports fan um I said mom the cubs just did something they have not done in your lifetime and she was 91 <laughs> so yeah bless my heart Mike is the exact way to say it but I yeah Howard I I went to Missouri because I wanted to be a baseball announcer as soon as I figured out about the age of 14 that I was not going to be playing in the major leagues for the White Sox, who were, were one of the teams I rooted for. Uh, I, I had an epiphany, a literal epiphany, first of my life. Cubs and the White Sox both on every day. And I watched both games every day. And a light bulb went off one day, and, and I thought, you know, these announcers 
are, are the same announcers that were there yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. Those announcers, they go to the ball game every day. For free. Damn near. And that's, <laughs> that's the part they don't tell you. But I, I literally had no concept, Mike, of making a living. I just want to go to the ball game. And, and so that's why. And at that time, there weren't some of the great broadcasting schools that there have been starting about 25 years ago. And Mizzou was, and I, of course, believe still is, uh, unquestionably the best undergraduate journalism program in America. I know I got my first job because I had a journalism degree from Missouri. Taught me a lot, made me a lot better. And um, and I think it's uh, the beginning of the road of why I'm doing what I'm doing and where I live today. The voice of the Dallas Cowboys, Brad Shammer is our guest. And Brad, um, what's it like to do games for the most recognized team in all of sports. I mean, and all of the things that come with it, be it players, ownerships, yeah. you've been around two of them, uh, and you've seen a lot of things, but what's it like on a daily basis to to assume that role, <clears throat> excuse me, of being the voice of the Dallas Cowboys? It, it's fun. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's fun. It's rewarding. I mean, you know, Howard, Howard was first-round draft choice of that franchise, and he would have been just as happy – to play football if he'd been drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals or the Seattle Seahawks. But it's different when you're doing whatever you're doing with the Dallas Cowboys. It's just not the same. And I don't mean to suggest by that, that they're better, but they're different and they've been different almost from their inception. And so, you know, I, I just kind of walked into that in the middle of them being really good. I came in in the middle of the 76 season and uh, started working with Vern. And so the second year that I was working with him, my first full year on the job, they won the Super Bowl. And the next year they went to the Super Bowl. And so I remember saying to myself after that game in Miami, which they lost to the Steelers, uh, okay, I think I get this. You go to training camp in July, and then the Super Bowl is in January. And then, so then after that, you're done. Well, then, of course, it was 14 years before I got the opportunity to do another Super Bowl. And now they haven't been in 26 or whatever it is. So, look, Chiefs fans understand about um, how cool it is when you go after a long wait like that. But the thing about the Cowboys is because of the unique – vision that Tech Schramm had, and frankly, that Jerry Jones has. Um, Jerry's built on what Tech's made, and he, he doesn't shirk from that. And and so they, they have had this amazing ability to be lightning rods and interesting and eminently watchable, and they did enough winning. They did so much winning from really – uh, the very early 70s, right through for 20 years, that it built them a cachet of love from network television because they're the most hated team in the national football. <laughs> and they, they're widely loved when they win. They're always hated. And guess what? Both of those groups of people turn on televisions and click on websites and all of the above. And so that's why networks love them. And they're always interesting. They've never not been interesting. When <laughs> they've true. been horrible, they've been interesting. <laughs> and uh, and right now they're not horrible. So I was just talking to uh, Zach Martin today, who, who I believe is going to be a Hall of Fame guard and one of the best I've ever seen. And, and, uh, and he's been there eight years. So he, he's been on some good teams. And he went to Notre Dame. He knows what a big program is. And I said uh, – that this this has got a big build up this game right now, but I said it's week ten. I mean, we're literally halfway through the season. Uh, are, are we making too much of it? He said, "Yeah, it's week ten, but he said it feels like a pretty big game." And um, I, I do think I think the players feel that. Um, certain look, the Chiefs have been where the Cowboys want to go now. But the thing that uh, players forget is, and Mike, this is, I believe, what you're alluding to, um, the fans 
they they haven't gone anywhere. They're the same people who cheered for the Super Bowl teams in the 90s and their and their parents cheered for the Super Bowl teams in the 70s. Those mm-hmm. folks are the same and they're the ones that made the Cowboys whatever it is they are. So to be in the middle of that, I mean I'd be lying if I said it wasn't fun and interesting and and it's nothing I can't take credit for it. My dad my dad's work brought him from Chicago to Dallas while I was in the army after I finished at Mizzou in the summer of 1970. He could have just as easily gone to Spokane or Poughkeepsie, and he didn't. He came to Dallas, and that's where I got a job, and here I am now. So it's not nothing that I've done, but, but it sure is fun. So this team this year, uh, virtually the same personnel from a year ago, minus a few pieces. Uh, we obviously know that there was a change a defensive coordinator, uh, Dan Quinn, came in and replaced um, uh, 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 Nolan, Mike, Mike Nolan, uh, son of Dick, of course, who was a longtime assistant with the Cowboys. You know, a great guy. Um, how? What have you seen? Just you know, from a from a morale standpoint, uh, from a scheme standpoint, from your vantage point, that this team is so different from last year. Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, the first thing I have to say is, uh, in spite of the fact that this is huddle up with Howard, I'm going to have to push back on Howard because this is not the same personnel. On offense, there's a lot of the same personnel. Uh, and, And the most important ones were not playing last year. They lost the quarterback about a quarter of the way into the season. They lost, uh, three fifths of their offensive line uh, either very early or never had them. And um, uh, I I would, I'd suggest if you play four different quarterbacks in a year, you're probably not going to have a good year. (laughs) And so that's on offense, but on defense, you know, they spent heavily of their draft resources on defense and they the most amazing thing that Dan Quinn has done to me, to, in addition to uh, improving the communication, that's what they all say, that the way it's explained and the way the staff relates to them is night and day. But they had eight veteran players make their team who all came from other places. So, you know, you had – you know, Randy Gregory, who's injured, I mean, he's working his way back. It'll be another about two weeks. And Demarcus Lawrence, they were on the team. Um, Leighton Van Der Esch was on the team. Uh, Jordan Lewis and Anthony Brown, two, two defensive backs, uh, were on the team. Trayvon Diggs was a, was a rookie who was kind of lost. So they brought in all these rookies, and then they brought in eight guys on defense, all on defense, and they have all been major rotation players or starters. So it's not the same team and personnel. And uh, the the shocking thing, I think, is the way they have all coalesced across uh, the offensive and defensive lines. And I think that the head coach has to get a lot of credit for that. He's the guy who – he is the same guy who hired Nolan, and that didn't go well at all. But he also is the guy that brought in Dan Quinn when he became available allowed Kellen Moore to keep the offense the way it was instead of the way Mike McCarthy might have changed it had he been calling the plays. That has been nothing short of brilliant. And Howard, what the players say, and and as you know, I put a lot of stock in that. Uh, What they say is this is the most unselfish team they've ever been on. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you just as an example, um, my experience is wide receiver rooms can can <laughs> have colorful personalities. A uh, bunch of divas, no doubt. They don't have a diva. Hmm. Amari Cooper is not a diva. In right. fact, Amari Cooper is a chess player. Amari Cooper is is now they're all they're all artistic. They are all. Everyone's got an ego, but Cooper Lamb. Gallup, and then all the role players up behind them. 
I'm telling you, there's not a diva among them, and I've never seen a wide receiver room like it. And 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 Prescott is really an, an unusual leader because he he uh, I, I will never forget his rookie year. Remember, he went to camp in 2016, vying for the third string quarterback job mm -hmm. with uh, Jamel Showers, who was a safety by the time the year was over. <laughs> And uh, and so um, the first thing that happened was Kellen Moore, who was the backup quarterback, broke his ankle in camp. And the next thing that happened was Tony Romo got hurt in a preseason game in Seattle. And now fourth round pick, you're it. And um, I mean, Mike Howard knows this is not me just saying this. Uh, I've always had a tremendous affinity for offensive linemen. I think they're the most intelligent players on the team. They have. Also, they have to sublimate their egos to make it a team. And so when, when veteran offensive linemen tell me separately from each other, when you go up to them and say, How's, how is he in the huddle? And all pro linemen are saying, he's fantastic. He's in complete command. He walked in. He was in charge from day one. But when I go in the locker room, in the days when we went in the locker room, I would go in the locker room during the week and you go in one day and his locker is next to Zeke Elliott's. Then the next day you walk in the locker room and he is sitting across, he's sitting there talking to Orlando Scandrick, an eight year veteran cornerback. And the next day you walk in the locker room and he's sitting down talking to Tyron Smith. And so he just, he is everybody's captain. He is, he is the team's, face in the truest sense for anybody they've had since since Aikman and um I think one of the key he's one of the keys Howard he is one of the and and look Mahomes is this way for the Chiefs but I, I will tell you that what kind of quarterback Dak Prescott is will be determined by his career he's doing pretty well but he's got he's got a long way to go let's but take a, a leader as a leader as and as a competitor and a role model, he's already on a par with Troy Aikman and Roger Staubach. Let's take a break. He's Brad Sham. Howard Richards is here. It's Huddle Up with Howard. Every day, Amron, Illinois works to deliver reliable energy throughout the state to on-the-go families, in-the-know grandparents, and busy students. But did you know we also have ways to manage your energy? Paperless billing, outage notifications, Pick a due date, auto pay, and so much more. So no matter who you are or how you use your energy, there's an option that's right for you. Learn more at AmarinIllinois.com slash options. Brad Sham is our guest. And, and Brad, you, you touched on a couple of players that you really like and you compare them to some other players that you witnessed in the past. So I'd like to ask you about some players that you've seen. And, and I don't want to just narrow it down to one player to position. But give me a couple of guys at different positions. And, and we'll, we'll, you know, Howard's already voted for himself to be one of the all time great linemen. <laughs> but there's some other guys that I look back on, like a Larry Allen. You mentioned Zach Martin. But as you look at different positions, give me a couple of names that really stood out for you. Oh, gosh. You know, um, we're talking about championship teams, Mike. Um, so Tyron Smith's one of my all time favorites. But I will tell you a guy who, uh, Eric Williams, had he not been yes. in an automobile accident that ended his career, would have long since been in the Hall of Fame. He was he was the conscience of that offensive line that won uh, those Super Bowls. He was he, he was remarkable. He had the best footwork I've ever seen. Yeah, he's he's just amazing. Now people ask me a lot after all these years. Uh, who's your favorite player? And my answer is usually, how many children do you have? <laughs> um, but I will tell you that the one guy, and I mean, there are guys, I, I love Michael. I couldn't love Michael Irvin more than I love Michael Irvin. Uh, there's just everything about him is is terrific. His behavior wasn't always great, but everything about <laughs> Michael is fantastic. The one guy that I would have paid money to watch was Randy White. Yes. R Randy White was, uh, Randy White was just, he was just different. Now the rules were, Howard knows, 
the the did you have to block him some in practice? What? Are you kidding me? Every day, <laughs> every day, and and I will say that you know he really helped elevate my game. And you're talking about playing with confidence on Sundays. If you're if you're taking care of Randy during the week, you know Sundays are a breeze. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I came along after Bob Lilly's career just by a year. But so Randy, Randy jumps off the page at me. Um, I, there are some guys who were not on great teams that uh, guys like Dat Wynn and, um, you know, Brady James played his butt off here. He was not a great player, but he was a terrific leader. Uh, and they were just weren't on good teams. Um and, uh, boy, the, I mean, there's a bunch of them. You know, the, as I'm running through the Rolodex in my mind, I keep coming up with offensive linemen. That's uh, fine. I, I'm the same way. I feel the same way about offensive linemen. They, I mean, they are the, the the bastion of what this game is all about. Uh, one of my all-time favorites was Mark Tuanay, who got – Got to rest his – got to rest his soul. Got to rest his soul. Tui, yeah. Tui was a free – so in the, in the days that – Tuane and Bill Bates, who had a great career here, uh, were rookie free agents. Now, in those days, and I'm not exaggerating, they they it was not uncommon for them to bring a hundred rookie free agents, a hundred rookies to camp. A hundred, a hundred, a hundred rookies <laughs> it was not uncommon. And so, um, in those days, they trained uh, six weeks, two a days, every day. And uh, the first few years, so 83, I'd been there five or six years. And um, I remember that I was in training camp for uh, about three weeks. I had to go home and I came back. When I came back, Tune is still in the rotation. I said, I guess I better figure out who he is. And, and he was a serviceable defensive lineman. And then he made himself uh, against his will uh, a, a Pro Bowl offensive lineman. You know, the, I was going to add two – Two things, those two guys. So you mentioned Mark Tuane, who I still have a scar on my left arm where if he grabbed me in practice when he's still playing defense and his thumb, his thumbnail just dug into my skin. Like it seemed like an inch deep. I still have a scar there. But Tui, who, who backed me up for uh, a period at left tackle, and Nate Newton, uh, who, uh, you know, he could barely run two laps around the field, the practice field, the old practice field at uh, Forest Lane and Abrams. Uh, but the guy, you know, he hung on by a thread, but he built himself into an all-pro, uh, Pro Bowl lineman. And, you know, I'm proud of those guys. And You know, Mark was maybe one of the funniest guys ever. Uh, his, his sense of humor was just off the chain. But I loved playing for those guys. And I was, you know, I had some injuries and, and – you know, there was my career was sort of tapering off, but it was just fun to watch both of those guys later on as their careers uh, blossomed. I'll tell you one other guy, Mike. Um, Daryl Johnston is one of the smartest play. Now they had some guys in the seventies. They had an offensive tackle named Pat Donovan, who was one of the smartest that I ever saw. And a lot of those guys, Pat was one of them. Uh, Landry liked to convert defensive college defensive lineman. Kurt Peterson from Missouri was one yeah. uh, who played on some, on some really good teams. Um, Pat Donovan is one of the smartest players I ever saw. Blaine Nye, who was a little, just, it, it, he was coming to the end when I started, he was a guard from Stanford who was a pro bowl player several times the, the day in uh, uh, whatever year it was that, uh, that, that, uh, Clint Longley had to take over for Staubach at quarterback because of an injury on Thanksgiving day and they beat Washington. Oh yeah. And, and uh, Blaine Nye called it the triumph of the uncluttered mind, which is <laughs> one, of the, one of the greatest left-handed compliments anyone's ever given. So I love Blaine. I really like Pat Donovan. Uh, but what I started to say was Daryl Johnston pound for pound. And inch for inch, Daryl Johnston might have been the best football player on those Super Bowl teams. Now we're talking about Aikman, Smith, Irvin, um, Dion. Yeah, Dion came. Dion just came for the one in in '95. Uh, um, but Johnston was so smart and uh, completely fearless and selfless. And Emmett said, will tell you in a heartbeat that 
Daryl's one of the biggest reasons that Emmett's the all-time rushing leader in the history of the NFL. He's another one of my favorites. Two guys that come to mind from different eras, <clears throat> one who's a teammate of mine, and the other is a current player on this team. Uh, my teammate that I was referring to is Everson Walls, and current starting quarterback, where's number seven, Trayvon Diggs. Uh, I, the first seven games, Diggs had seven picks. And, you know, in ever since, or eight, ever since rookie year, uh, 1981, you know, making 25000 a year, living at home with his mother, uh, he leads the league, didn't even start all 16 games, leads the league in interceptions. What comparisons can you make between the two of them? There are some. Diggs is uh, taller. Um, Cubby would hate me for – that's Wall's nickname. Cubby, <laughs> he would hate me for saying that Diggs is probably a little more athletic. I, I'm, I'm certain he's a little faster. Um, the sense of the football is one of the things that unites them. I just had this conversation with Walls uh, not four weeks ago. Um, that rookie year of his – and I've never seen this in anybody else. When he would read, he was so good at reading the flight of the ball. When he had it read and he knew that he was going to make the interception, his body language changed. An aura came over him. And I swear I could tell every time when he was going to intercept the ball just by looking at the at his body language. And he, I asked him about that once, he, and he, he said, yes, you're absolutely right. He knew what I was talking about. So Diggs, one of his eight interceptions has been like that. And um, I don't – there have been so many <laughs> right now. <laughs> I really don't remember which one. It might have been uh, – it might have been Carolina, but I don't remember. But it doesn't matter. Um, there was one that he, he was tracking the ball in a trail position – he saw it. He read it. He knew it was his. And all of a sudden, this, his whole body language changed, and he was just making the reception. And he looked exactly like Everson Walls in that moment, and it's the only time I've ever seen it on anyone else. And, you know, Cubby was a free agent, undrafted free agent, so he, he probably shouldn't have been, but he, he had to be really, really smart. Uh, about playing the position. Diggs is a much more of a thoroughbred. He's a second round pick from Alabama who could have been a first round pick instead of a free agent from Grambling. And so I think Diggs has a, uh, uh, he's got more to learn. Uh, he's got, there's a lot about his game. He's got to clean up his, uh, his technique is average and his, he's leading the leading the league in cornerback penalties. So there's a lot of stuff he's got to clean up, but not everybody has a nose for the ball like he does. Both willing tacklers, and um, Cubby's another one of my favorites too. And you know I can't wait to watch Diggs' career unfold because he's only going to get better. One more Walls question: Does he make the Hall of Fame? It's going to be hard. Um, I'm 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 hoping he can get into the Cowboys Ring of Honor. Which Deserves I believe to be. he he has coming to him, uh, but um, and I think that would help. I think Hall of Fame voters look at that stuff, but um, it's the facts are that the people who vote most, a lot of people who vote now, they didn't see him play. Yeah, yeah, and and some of the Dallas teams he played on weren't very good, so. Uh, I think it'll be a long shot for him to make the Hall of Fame, which is a shame because he could easily be there. But I'm really hoping that that he can get in the Ring of Honor. And as you know, Howard, the thing that you know, the Cowboys had the first Ring of Honor. A lot of a lot of teams have them now. Uh, but when you walk in that stadium and you look up and see, like I had this conversation with Drew Pearson when he finally made the Ring of Honor two or three years ago after waiting a ridiculous amount of time. Mm -hmm. And then they all realize once they're in, it doesn't matter because then from, I said, from that moment, you know, from now into when you've been dead for 200 years, people are going to walk in this stadium and look up and see your name. So you're never going away. And it would be a big deal for Everson. And I, and I really hope that, that he gets that. Well, Brad, we are out of time. 
we could continue to do this, but we know you have some other obligations and we I certainly do. appreciate you spending some time with us today. Hey, best of luck um, to you and the Cowboys this season. And hopefully we'll have a chance to chat and catch up down the road. And I plan to see you in Kansas City on Sunday. You know where I'll be. That's right. You're you're always welcome in our booth. It's very high up. I know. I've been there. <laughs> you're more than welcome all the time. All, All right. right He's friend. Brad Sham. That's Howard it. Richards. I'm Mike Claiborne. We thank you for watching another edition of Huddle Up with Howard, our special guest, Brad Sham. We'll talk to you next week.